Okay, can you see this uh, okay? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, well, my program tonight is going to be about uh, the discovery of exoplanets. It's a little bit of a historical review, plus uh, a review of some of the current uh, operations. But most of all, it's uh, an introduction to many of the uh, different techniques that are used to observe and discover exoplanets. Uh, there's some very interesting news uh, going around because we not only discovered an exoplanet in the picture here you see at the upper left, it, but that's an exomoon. Uh, the two pictures down below are the three and a half meter telescope in Arizona for the uh, WIYN uh, observatory. And they've got a fantastic instrument there on a three and a half meter telescope, which takes very detailed spectra. You can see how uh, uh, they took the spectra of 51 Pegasus B and actually uh, partitioned it very well. So there's a lot of analysis going on. Plus, uh, the test people made an extra camera. So they're petitioning for a possible another, another telescope launch or maybe even a, a smaller version of tests to go up in the future. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, take the adventure away. Uh, if you looked at some of the results of these exoplanets that are being discovered now, uh, you'll find a, a number of, of planets going around different stars. And some of them, like the Kepler 90, are kind of unique because it actually has eight planets going around a G-type solar star. And uh, that's within the uh, inner solar system, within the Earth's uh, orbital position around the sun. They have eight planets in Kepler-90. Uh, it's been suggested that all these planets formed uh, at different times, but uh, the orbital is, uh, situation is not like what we have here uh, with the rocky planets in the middle and the gas giants on the outside, because it's quite different. So uh, the first surprise by looking at all these exoplanets was the wide variety of uh, situations that they have in their orbital configuration. Uh, yeah, and our second preconceived notion was that there was a gigantic nebula that uh, was flattened out under rotation and eventually spawned uh, our solar system. Well, that model doesn't really apply, even though there have been things like the uh, Nice model, NICE, look that up, uh, which has been replaced now by another model called the Grand Track, Grand, the Grand Tack, excuse me, uh, in which the outer giant planets can wander inwards and wander back outwards and actually change position. So uh, the Nice model and the Grand Tack are two uh, updates on our own solar system formation. So you can get uh, information on those if you uh, just dial it up on the internet. Uh, they're quite involved, and uh, it's very interesting to watch how they've progressed in the last couple of years. Well, the first method I'm going to talk about uh, was an old-fashioned method where you took pictures and over a period of, of years and uh, measured the position on an, on an analyzing machine. Uh, but uh, that was primarily done for the stars that are closest to the Earth for different reasons or other. This has been, whole process has been taken over by the Gaia spacecraft, which is measuring the position, spectral types, and a lot of other information. Uh, but I'm going to concentrate uh, on, a, on the, uh, some of the nearest and the first stars that were developed, were, in, were found to have exoplanets. Well, Barnard's star uh, was uh, a study uh, by a astronomer at the Sproul Observatory called Peter Van de Kamp. Uh, a couple of associates had published previous analysis where they uh, announced planets around other stars, but he uh, looked at 24 years of observations and uh, announced uh, a figure here. And in this uh, figure from his paper, you can see that there's some sort of a variation, but uh, uh, it's on the level of microns, you know. So uh, he uh, first published his results in 63 and reanalyzed it in 69. He says, oh, yeah, I'm great. Uh, but he revised it again in 75 and 82, uh, about the time that he had retired and he'd come under further criticism. 
Well, but the, the planets just weren't there because other observatories checked out Barnard's star. And uh, if you compare his results from his paper on the left with results from Malik or from the Keck, uh, there, there is just no comparison between what he saw and uh, in 1976, uh, a new observatory director, Wolf Heinz, uh, took over and reanalyzed Van de Kamp's analysis. And, and uh, he couldn't confirm not only this discovery, but any of these discoveries. So, uh, as I said, uh, uh, Peter Van de Kamp there, he actually came up with a further papers to try to rebut even his uh, new boss, uh, would, well, after he got retired. Uh, the only success has come out of uh, Van Bree's book, uh, Star. Uh, it's got a mass of uh, 0.08 times the mass of the sun. And it's essentially found by its proper motion across the sky. And uh, this is a binary system. And a lesser shining star, about 20 light years away, is the one that has a planet going around it. On the right, uh, the, the European Gaia spacecraft, uh, has measured like possibly as many as 1.5 billion nearby stars, but hasn't found any exoplanets at all. Uh, there is some controversy going on uh, about whether or not a third star has been very recently discovered through uh, to have an exoplanet by astrometry. But I'm going to stick with two because that's what the Caltech uh, website that I go to uh, I'll, I'll describe that in a few minutes. Uh, but another problem besides uh, knowing, uh, just limiting our search to the G-type solar stars was uh, knowing that uh, the stars that there are in orbit need to be around the Goldilocks zone where water can be found. And uh, that's another key ingredient. So there's some assumptions made in the beginning here when talking with uh, different kinds of uh, people that have made uh, these observations. Uh, and they are legitimate, but things have changed because of instrumentation improvements. Well, uh, even now, Barnard Star is still being questioned uh, in Sky and Telescope, actually in in uh, Nature in 2018, there, there was the publication that says, yes, it does have a planet going around it. And uh, in the Astronomical Journal in 2021, which you can download on the archive uh, website, uh, says, no, that uh, the 2018 discovery is wrong. So uh, who knows? But uh, uh, that's a, a possible uh, discovery uh, now via... Uh, radial velocity, not just uh, the astrometry, but a new technique. So now let's take a look at our second topic here. Radial velocity has actually discovered uh, 935 planets uh, as of just a few days ago. This process just involves measuring the tiny wobbles moving back and forth as a, uh, a planet moves around its host star. You can see that in the spectra, if you look at the right end, you'll see that there's a little narrow line at the far right in the spectra that comes and goes and, and shifts position very slightly. So as the planet, the red dot goes around uh, uh, and circles uh, the very center of the planet and star situation, uh, it, it actually shifts its wavelengths of light from the red to the blue and back and forth. So that's the whole heart of the radial velocity method. Now, that was developed in the early 1990s by a, no and a number of people have championed it. So it just wasn't an individual person, but the first discovery of an uh, exoplanet was made by these two guys in Europe and uh, by using radial velocity and the website that uh, you can go to is uh, listed on the second line here. So it's an exoplanet archive out of uh, Caltech. Uh, you can download all kinds of information. If you just want uh, to download all the data itself and put it into an Excel spreadsheet, you can do that. 
or you can look at the summary of all the statistics, which uh, is probably just as interesting. But look at how little data they have, but sure enough, a period of around uh, 4.1 days was found. And uh, they were measuring a, a change in the position of the star, like 53 meters per second. So uh, that was an amazing discovery and uh, they deserve all the credit they got for it. Well, the system itself, uh, 51 Pegasi is, is off on the, uh, uh, just in above the square of uh, Pegasus here, uh, along with a few other interesting stars. And uh, it's considered to be the prototypical hot Jupiter. And because it's very hot, like over 2,400, almost 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's located relatively nearby at about 50 light years away. Well, uh, if you'll read the latest issue of, uh, or I think it was the October issue of Sky and Telescope, you'll know that uh, there are now cool Jupiters, there are warm Jupiters, and besides the hot Jupiters, and nobody really knows what's going on there. It's a very confusing article. You have to uh, pay attention to some of the words that he's talking about in that article. Well, the European team scooped the California team. Look at how nice their data look, but uh, they didn't believe the spectral type that was listed in the Bright Star catalog published at Yale. And so one week later, after the European announcement came out, uh, Marcy and Butler out there in California uh, published their paper and uh, at a meeting, and uh, they continued to make radial velocity measurements. And in fact, these two guys are responsible for the discovery of 70 of the first exoplanets of the first 100 exoplanets ever found, again, by using radial velocity. Well, sure enough, uh, they got discovery. Uh, they, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2019, along with James Peoples for his work in uh, cosmology. But uh, the way it's worded is as for the discovery of an exoplanet, it does not say the discovery of the first exoplanet because there's a very interesting story there. If you look at just 51 Pegasi, the stars are a little bit better, a little bit bigger, and so is the planet. It's actually 47% uh, less massive than Jupiter, but it's quite a bit larger. And again, the star versus the sun or the planet versus Jupiter is quite an interesting uh, comparison. Again, if you look at October's issue of Sky and Tell, you want to look at pages 28 to 33. Well, another star that came along very soon afterwards uh, was another G-type star having uh, one planet. Here's an artist's conception of, of what it must look like. Uh, again, uh, these are some of the closest and earliest stars that were found to have exoplanets. And let's look at a couple of them. Again, 70 Virginis B would be a single planet open, orbiting a one star. Well, uh, another gas giant was found in the Ursa Major. Uh, you can see uh, it's located down here. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. And... Uh, it's another gas giant. Uh, essentially, it's a little bit uh, smaller, uh, but there are not only one, but there are, there's a B, C, and D. The first exoplanet around the star, we given a designation of letter B. The second one gets C, the next one is D. So the whole alphabetical process here. So you have three planets going around this one star. Uh, Tau Bodis AB has a funny name here because this is a binary star and the capital A in its name means it's circling the brighter star of the binary pair of stars. And this one is again a, a sun-like star with a red dwarf companion and the planet itself goes around the brighter sun-like star. Uh, another one found through uh, in, in Andromeda now Another binary, again, a gas giant. Not only do we have uh, uh, a different kind of uh, system here, you got a B, a C, and a D, all gas giants. 
uh, all found by uh, going around through uh, uh, the radial velocity method. This one is uh, two sun-like stars with uh, a third star as a red giant. And uh, the planet that they found in this discovery uh, was actually circling around uh, the lesser bright solar type star. So that's the bit given the letter B. And because it's the first planet they found going around that star, so it's got the BB. Uh, the game here now, another binary. Uh, it not only had four when it was originally discovered, and five, and possibly more. Uh, another one was uh, unconfirmed later on, but you can see there's a uh, an AE uh, besides the AB, uh, an AC, uh, and uh, all the way up through AD, AEF, all discovered by radial velocity. Well, getting back to the closest star now, uh, the figure on the left is actually a description of uh, what radial velocity is like, because not only do you have the radial motion towards or away from us, uh, but you also have a transverse velocity uh, at a, across the, our field of view. And together, they give you this little red vector here, which is a true space motion for that star. Well, again, this is a triple star system, and the uh, Proxima Centauri is the smallest one. So uh, the, the planet now is letter C, and it actually has a B and a C uh, planet, the two planets circling around that. But it's magnetically active because of its uh, spectral type as a red dwarf companion. So that probably uh, baked or sterilized the planet and removed any kind of an atmosphere or any kind of chance for water a long time ago. Well, the question now is, uh, was 51 Pegasi B the first exoplanet? And the answer is no. Uh, Gordon Campbell, who was an expert in uh, radial velocity, found a two and a half year warble, war, wobble in a binary star, Gamma Cephei. Uh, it's suggested as an exoplanet, but uh, the announcement was disbelieved. Uh, he discovered that in 87, and in 1992, he published a retraction and thought it might be a stellar pulsation. But in 2002, guess what? Gamma Cephei, the brighter star, had a companion found by radial velocity. Again, when the technology became uh, a little bit better. Well, Here's what that system looks like. Uh, this is a very bright star at the top of Cepheus. Uh, it's a binary star about 45 light years away. Uh, and it's suspected of being variable. Uh, there was a competition uh, a few years ago to name exoplanets. And I uh, suggested uh, the name Hoflite for uh, Dort Hoflite from Yale University as uh, a fitting name for, for that star, but it, it uh, got a, a different uh, name in the competition because uh, I guess I didn't get enough votes. So vote for me next time. Another early one was found by uh, uh, David Latham at the Harvard Observatory in Boston, Cambridge. Uh, he found something with 11 times the mass of Jupiter going around the star and announced it in 1989 as uh, he said it was likely a, a brown dwarf. Uh, it's listed in NASA's database of exoplanets, but uh, in 2019, it was found to be a red or a brown dwarf. Uh, but here again, it's in there because it's data, and uh, data, you have to question it sometime and really get involved with the history. Uh, the first exoplanets discovered was actually a bizarre zombie-type star, uh, a pulsar with an unbelievable name of B1257 plus 12B, was found to have three planets circling a pulsar which uh, is essentially a white dwarf. 
Okay, is anybody trying to talk there? Or, But uh, it was circling uh, the pulsar, and obviously these planets were fried by the intense radiation. Not only do you have radiation coming out of the neutron star's poles, but you have very active magnetic fields going around here. Uh, again, these are kind of a uh, zombie-type planets because uh, it, it's, it's got to have been consumed, fried, baked, uh, refried, and uh, obviously not the place where, where you could expect any kind of uh, a planet to be. So it was just too bizarre to be believed until uh, other kinds of pulsars they were analyzed. Uh, there were several hundred pulsars recently anal analyzed, and of those several hundred pulsars using this pulsar timing technique, uh, at places like uh, Arecibo, which doesn't look like this, I have to say, anymore. Uh, but the waveforms and things that they're looking at now uh, showed anomalies in the timing of the radio pulses. And it, it revealed information about the orbits of uh, the planets themselves. And in, in this particular instance, another uh, pulsar timing method looked at another pulsar with the Nomenclature B1620-26, and it's actually a planet that goes around two stars. So this is considered to be uh, a circumbinary planet because it's uh, one single planet going around two stars. Well, that's kind of unusual because it's a pulsar and a white dwarf. So uh, the white dwarf is uh, probably originated from a star with uh, less than 10 times the mass of the sun. And the pulsar would have obviously started with a much more massive star, perhaps as much as 25 times the mass of the sun. And it collapsed beyond the white dwarf stage into a magnetically active uh, star that emits all kinds of pulsations. And it's a very interesting thing to think about. Uh, but these are zombie stars. And this recent survey just got announced uh, that less than one half of a percent of pulsars actually have some kind of a planet. They haven't published their results, but they have published uh, their study. Well, uh, what about other kinds of observations? The radial velocity uh, technique is still going strong. You can see by the red lines here, a uh, new kind of a technique here uh, is, is measures the transits of a planet in front of and behind uh, its host star. And you can see by, by even this late in the year that 2022 just keeps getting uh, larger and larger. Again, you can look at the Exoplanet Archive at, uh, at Caltech and get an idea of the statistics or get all the data you want about each one of these discoveries. And uh, they'll group it down uh, if you want to play with uh, an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, the transit method is the fourth method we're going to talk about. And it's actually discovered many more planets uh, than the radial velocity technique. And the picture on the left sort of diagrams what's happening here is that you have a, when the star passes in front, it dims the star a little bit. And uh, when the planet goes around uh, behind the sun uh, uh, or uh, leaves uh, the front of the sun, the light returns to normal. But a limitation of the transit method uh, is that the star's and exoplanet's orbit has to be within a narrow range that we can see from the Earth. So there is a limitation based on just the physical orientation of of stars so that the transit method uh, doesn't really discover all stars either, or all exoplanets either, but that's fundamentally limited to a, a narrow zone uh, that intersects our line of sight. Well, you would expect that the test satellite or the Kepler satellite, uh, excuse me, would be the first observation of a transiting satellite. But a French satellite was already in orbit before Kepler ever left the launch pad. And they discovered a super Earth 
uh, only a couple million miles from a uh, star. And uh, not only did it have a super Earth, but it's got a Neptune-like star. And there's another one uh, uh, that's been unconfirmed at the present time. But uh, this one is uh, uh, something that uh, the French had, and it orbited from 2006 until 2013. And, uh, yeah, again, that's, this discovery was announced in February of 2009. Well, what about Kepler? Well, it was launched March 7th, almost a month later, and it has to go through its checkout. And it was targeted to look at the uh, brightness changes due to these transits in the Cygnus Lyra region. Uh, it did that for a number of years, and we did find uh, Luke's home planet here, otherwise known as Kepler-16b. Uh, it's a planet that goes around two stars, so it's really in a circumbinary orbit, a couple of hundred light years away. Uh, there's a, another uh, Kepler uh, planet going around uh, the joint there, found in 2011. And so far, uh, I think there's about 13 circumbinary planets uh, that were discovered by the time that the Kepler mission ended. Uh, the Kepler results are shown here on the left as for the primary mission. And the originally, it, it, uh, it uh, has now almost got 2,700 confirmed exoplanets. Uh, they're not necessarily confirmed by Kepler, but by ground-based or satellite observations. And they have another 2,000 to go. So they've actually verified about close to 60% of, of the original uh, run of planet, exoplanets discovered by the Kepler. Uh, the K2 mission started in 2014 and ended in 2014. What happened was that the, uh, uh, the any, any orbiting observatory actually uses four reaction wheels and uh, it only needs three to work and one acts as a spare. But after the second reaction wheel failed, uh, the ground crews were able to reprogram it to use the pressure of satellite and just keep it looking at different sections of along the ecliptic. Uh, you might not think that was uh, too valuable, but a very interesting side discovery came out of that K2 mission, which was the fact that there are a lot of near-Earth asteroids within the orbit of the Earth that we knew nothing about until after 2014, we started looking at the K2 mission data. So that was a surprise and also a shocking surprise to the people that keep track of near-Earth asteroids. Well, uh, in 2018, TESS was launched and it operated uh, to look at uh, 13 sectors in the Northern Hemisphere, for a period of time and changed to another sector after 27 days. Uh, it finished its observations in the Southern Hemisphere first and then went on to the Northern Hemisphere in 2020. And uh, uh, since uh, there's a spare camera, well, there may be a companion test launched, uh, not to L1, L2, but to L5, which is, uh, uh, the trailing uh, Lagrange point, if you're interested in that. But I haven't heard anything further about this particular proposal. Uh, but again, there's a camera available for launch. Well, the survey for the Southern Hemisphere is shown on the left, but look at the Northern Hemisphere. There's quite a large blank area here uh, because they couldn't survey the area where the sun and the moon were. And uh, that's a limitation. But again, you can see the, the 13 sectors, and they don't quite cover the entire sky. But uh, hopefully, uh, they did uh, manage to minimize the gaps where, where uh, they could still get data. Uh, one of the more interesting discoveries here for very large uh, observatories is by direct imaging. Uh, if you look at the star 51 Eridanus B, uh, the planet. Uh, this was taken with the 8.4 meter telescope in uh, Gemini South. Uh, 
approximately uh, 61 exoplanets have now been discovered as of recently. But this is a triple star system. Uh, and the picture on the right, the central star is blocked out. And what you're seeing uh, are the images of other exoplanets circling around that star itself. So uh, this is our fifth method of uh, looking at relatively nearby stars and blocking out the light as I you would use in a coronagraph and seeing if there's anything there. But that does take a, quite a bit of time. And this was a very early observation and that technology has improved drastically. Uh, the system now looks like uh, something like that where, where there's a gas giant uh, about two and a half times the mass of Jupiter going around uh, that star system. So uh, that's a very interesting way. And not only can it image exoplanets, the picture on the left actually uh, has a star symbol uh, that where an object was blacked out because it, it's in a cloud of formation. And by blocking out the where the star isn't quite turned on through nuclear fusion yet, you can take a look at some of the clouds of debris that are accumulating around uh, that particular star. Not only that, uh, the clouds, but you can actually see disks by using direct imaging. Uh, an example here, there's actually a large gap, but it's actually got material between the two gaps. So maybe there are two little planets sweeping out that two little planets sweeping out those two little gaps and possibly uh, they could collide and unite or they may just go off in different directions by an unknown process. But it's, it's uh, an interesting procedure now with the very largest telescopes uh, to see something like that. Another method is found about 135 planets re revolves around this thing called microlensing. It says when a, uh, when a nearby star, shown in red here, passes in front of another distant star, uh, the nearby object can actually produce this uh, change in the brightness of the distant star so that by taking a series of observations over, over a period of time, it's not just hours or minutes, but it could be days, and what you would see is a curve that actually shows a slight increase uh, it can reveal a lot about the near, nearby star. And if the star, if this star has any planets, uh, you'll see that little peak itself. So uh, this is a, a, an example of that would be this uh, discovery made in 2015. Uh, the best curve that fits the data is a dashed line, but you'll notice there's a little bump in there. Uh, that uh, is a gas giant with about uh, two times the mass of Jupiter circling a low mass type dwarf star. So all these techniques are, are discovering uh, uh, different mass stars, uh, different types of uh, spectral type stars, but uh, it it's, can only be seen when a, two stars pass in front of each other in an occultation. Well, another method has discovered nine stars. And uh, this is known as Einstein's planet because it just grazes the edge of uh, its host star. And Kepler 76b has a light curve, which shows an unusual characteristics that is predicted by special relativity in which uh, the photons from that star pile up in the direction of the star's motion. So that's a, a very strange effect, but it, it do, did reveal a hot Jupiter circling uh, that star. And uh, the star itself is kind of uh, unusually shaped. So that, that kind of a thing uh, uh, is, is uh, very unusual. Well, to round out that topic there, there's all kinds of techniques. Uh, for example, not when you get a curve of a star in transit, you can look at number of transits and see if there's any variations. And that's a very interesting one because now the variations can reveal not just the one star that's in our line of sight, but it can also give information about 
any other planets that are out there that can affect the star's position as well. So you can pick up the, the multiple stars by looking at transit variations. Well, the IAU uh, dis differentiates between 15 different types of stars. And if you look at this curve, you'll see all the terrestrial planets are listed in red. You go from Mars down here, all the way up through Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, and Jupiter up here at the high end. And uh, you'll think, see things like WASP 43b or, or uh, uh, some of the uh, 55 Cancri, uh, some of the more interesting stars, but you have uh, terrestrial planets uh, uh, as well as super Earths or mini Neptunes. And you get to the sub Jupiters and, and there's actually a, a whole th thesaurus to describe which category type star that you should be using, what, what pronoun you should be using for your discovery if, if you have one of these 15 different types. Uh, the methods do have limits as we discussed previously. For example, uh, if you looked at the uh, masses of these stars by looking at the different methods here, so radial velocity is in red, uh, transits now are in the green. So you'll see that the radial velocity picks up very massive stars with long periods down here. And their transit method can pick up stars, I mean, planets with different size masses and very small or short uh, orbital periods, very close to their host star. And of course, there's a few other things in here uh, about micro lensing, it's got little triangles, but uh, it's uh, kind of an interesting picture to think about that. Uh, the, the transit method has, has limits, but it complements the radial velocity. Uh, spectral analysis, well, I mentioned at the beginning, there's a brand new instrument and in uh, Arizona here, uh, at, uh, mounted on the three and a half meter uh, for ultra precise spectral observations. And for example, it actually took a, a spectra of that first exoplanet when it passed in front of its host star. Not only that, you get the information in the spectra, but that can be analyzed in tremendous detail. And uh, that's known as uh, uh, transmission spectroscopy because it, it, the, the planet has to be in front. So you're actually looking, sunlight from that star is passing through any atmosphere. So you can get an idea of whether, what composition uh, any atmosphere of a nearby exoplanet might have. Well, atmospheres uh, can be studied, but you really want to look uh, for exo uh, biosignatures. Uh, you want to look for not only things like uh, carbon monoxide, but you want to look for methane, water vapor. You want to look for things like carbon dioxide. And in fact, now that uh, the JS, JWST is up there, uh, it's actually beginning to fulfill its promise. And it, if you look at the uh, proposals suggested for the first year, there are essentially 70 exoplanets that are going to be studied during the, the first year's observations. We've already seen one of those. Uh, it was a star that was analyzed by spectra on the Earth, and they couldn't find any water vapor in its atmosphere. Well, lo and behold, they did find water vapor when they used the ultra-precise measurements from the Webb Space Telescope. That came out in July 12th. Uh, the second exoplanet uh, was analyzed with uh, a transit diagram and actually shows the presence of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So it's kind of an interesting process now that we got another 68 stars to get some interesting uh, discoveries here. Well, wouldn't you know it? Uh, People are already questioning these results. There's a group of astronomers at MIT and Harvard that uh, have raised a technical object objection to uh, the opaqueness of the light from a distant star at infrared wavelengths being a little bit different than visible light uh, wavelengths. Uh, that re that's referred to as the opacity or the opaqueness of, of the light transmitting through uh, a medium like a gas. Now they suggest that uh, it's a possible uh, in the paper that they have published very recently in the last week or so, I believe, 
uh, that uh, there could be a, a significant problem with this kind of discovery. For example, if you analyze this curve based on a certain set of assumptions about the opaqueness of the gas at infrared, uh, and came out and said that, oh, it has 25% water vapor in its atmosphere, it might only have 5%. So uh, the MIT guys have, a, have, have some explaining to do. And you could, you, if you've never thought of astronomy as a contact sport, uh, you haven't been listening uh, because it is a sport. Uh, another one that was imaged uh, in four different wavelengths shows the planet around the star from a Hipparchos catalog. And you can see the planet going around the star here because the star is blocked out because the web now has the ability to block out the light from the central uh, host star. And uh, you can look this up on the any of the deep sky surveys. And uh, it's quite an interesting thing here. So I, I can imagine that someone is gonna go out there and he's got a red, green, and a, well, red, blue, and a violet image here. And he just might combine it to get more of a true sized picture here. But but the, the colors that uh, are being released for pictures with the Webb Space Telescope have arbitrary uh, color designations for, with red being the, the longest wavelength uh, filter that you use so that uh, you should take it with a grain of salt that something is red or green in any of the pictures. And it's up to the image processing that, uh, that's being done on the, on the uh, data from the Webb Space Telescope. Well, in contrast to biosignatures, another group has said, we should be looking for something else. We should be trying to pick up radio signals or laser light signals and other systems or Perhaps we should even be looking for smog. I mean, we don't, their argument is we don't want to be discovering a, 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 an inhabited planet that uh, has a culture that's not at our level or a little bit ahead of us or even thousands of years ahead of us. But they want to look at some, bitty, uh, some planet where, where there's possibility of gaining some information and, and uh, their, their paper was uh, released in September. So uh, so here again is an example of uh, the biosignature versus the technosignature uh, uh, combat going on and behind the lines in the astronomy. So uh, uh, get your helmets and your flak jackets ready. Uh, but KEOPS was a European transit measuring telescope meant launched in 2019. And we haven't heard very much from that, but it's a European telescope. Uh, w first was a telescope that was made out of a one of a couple of mirrors that were uh, designated for national technology assets. And they found out that they didn't need these very large mirrors anymore. And they donated them to, to NASA. And after doing uh, an initial study, NASA says, well, we can build a, uh, uh, a space telescope and look for planets with a much larger field of view at visible wavelengths than Hubble. Well, the Europeans are still going to get into the act with another transiting measuring uh, tel a satellite called PLATO, which could be launched as early as 2026. And another more sensitive one to look at uh, atmospheres of exoplanets and, and by towards the end of, of this decade. Well, so here you have this whole sequence here, beginning with Hubble and the visible Spitzer and the uh, uh, X-ray version. Uh, Kepler tests, uh, W first now here has been renamed now for Nancy Grace Roman, who was the NASA program scientist who sort of shepherded the Hubble through the long years of congressional approvals and uh, she, she was responsible. So she is responsible for getting that telescope into orbit. And she is technically considered the mother of Hubble. Uh, there's another one going to be sent out to L2 in the future. But there are also some the large binocular telescopes besides the Keck telescope here in the ground. 
and uh, new technology kind of uh, telescopes that are being uh, developed across the world. So the exoplanet emissions are going to be able to be verified through not only ground-based, but uh, space-based uh, observations. Well, uh, you won't believe this one. Uh, NASA has approved this project for with several million dollars with uh, program scientists at uh, JPL and uh, 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 well, corporate sponsorship by the Aerospace Corp. And they're developing a proposal to send a number of satellites out uh, beyond uh, 600 AU from the Earth. Uh, you're not going to get a rocket to do this. And if you consider the fact that uh, our mission to Pluto took nine years, uh, they expect to get out there with uh, by using solar sails. But that might take 20 years. So, I mean, you're, you're talking about uh, uh, astronomers that uh, would have to pass this off to, to their descendants. And not only it's uh, with this one meter telescope uh, get out there in pieces, but it would have to assemble itself in root or when it got there. They think that when it got out to about 600 AU, uh, that it could look back at the sun now and use that to form a micro lensing image of an exoplanet. And you can see their simulation here in the upper right. Not, o not only that, but they expect to be able to get a rough idea, a very pixelated picture of what that exoplanet might look like. But it does seem uh, kind of extraordinary with a low chance of success, if, uh, which is just my opinion here. But there are a few million dollars being spent on this project already. Another proposal was uh, announced, and you can dial this up on the archive. Uh, website to actually measure uh, uh, the magnetic field of an exoplanet around a nearby star that isn't too magnetically active. The problem that uh, they, I see here is that uh, not only did TESS uh, find stars that uh, had exoplanets, but it also discovered about over 25,000 flaring type stars. And you haven't heard too much about that either. So I would imagine that they should get that data together about flaring stars and publish that as soon as possible. But this particular group uh, published a paper and actually did a whole analysis of uh, uh, having a, a, a very active star in the center here with an occulting disk being blocked off and having a, a close by planet uh, being uh, having uh, its magnetic field being evaporated. But uh, again, this does seem to border on a very skeptical kind of an observation. Uh, but what we found is that originally when we, when these exoplanet studies just looked at solar type stars, uh, that uh, the red dwarf stars are equally uh, capable of spawning planets. Uh, there's actually uh, a recent paper which uh, shows uh, an exoplanet around the white dwarf. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, pulsar planets have been surveyed again and uh, found to be very rare, uh, rarely inhabited by any kind of uh, exoplanets around the pulsars. So uh, we need to expand that, and we do have the capability now of working with more satellites and more larger telescopes on the ground. Well, one of the more interesting red giant, I mean, red dwarf observations is the TRAPPIST-1 system, which is only 40 light years away. This is a very heavily studied system because there are eight planets essentially located uh, within the orbit of Mars, let's say. And only three of them are in the Goldilocks zone here. They're labeled uh, TRAPPIST uh, E, F, and G. 
uh, because uh, that's where the water would be most likely. They're all Earth size, and three were originally discovered in 2016 with a telescope in Chile, but uh, they also have a telescope in Morocco, plus they confirmed the observations with the Spitzer Space Telescope before it was shut down in 2020. So I would be very interested in the data that they get for TRAPPIST-1, and it is one of those stars that's on the list of the 70 that the, the web will study in its first year of observation. Well, the goal of all these is to find Earth-sized exoplanets, and for my money, if you look at just the, the most Earth-like conditions there, if you compare the size of the Earth, uh, 186F, uh, shown next to it there, is probably, probably uh, the closest one we have so far, but that's just it. It's so far that uh, it needs further analysis, because uh, if you believe the Techno Signatures planet, people, uh, we could say that uh, the biosignature shows that, oh, there's plenty of water in the clouds and on the planet. And we could get there and there wouldn't be anything with the super precise observations made with uh, the Webb telescope. So it's, uh, again, it's, uh, it's a contact sport that's going on and uh, we'll see what the data shows. Uh, but remember one thing, it's, this is Dorothy's Law. If you've never heard it, you've only heard it from me. Always remember and don't ever forget. What's that? There's no place like home. And you don't need ruby slippers because in the book she was wearing silver slippers. So, so uh, pay attention to uh, that law. So uh, to wrap things up, uh, I just want to show you a picture of the observatory we, we run out at the White Memorial. We actually have three, uh, two computerized telescopes and a mount, which is computerized for a third telescope. Uh, you can find out uh, by looking at the whitememorialcc.org website. They do have a calendar. They also have a quarterly uh, little uh, newsletter, uh, which lists a whole number of other events, not just us, but but the astronomy programs have been uh, that we've been posting there for going on 12 years now uh, are in the top three of the programs here. So we're competing with birds and mammals and snakes and bees. And uh, so uh, we're very happy to be out there and uh, running the uh, Dort Hofflight Observatory at the White Memorial. This was originally built by the club in uh, at Mattatuck. Uh, college down there in Waterbury, but uh, that that club now has turned over the operation of the observatory there to uh, the Litchfield Hills Club. So uh, I hope to see uh, many of you out at the uh, Connecticut Star Party tomorrow, and again on Saturday. Uh, the weather should be very interesting. My program uh, is going to be talking about the uh, details of. Uh, uh, the the ops, op, yeah, op, opposition of Mars, which is coming up in December. But don't let that December 7th and 8th date fool you when it's closest. Uh, it's actually December 1st. So you can actually get very decent views of Mars a month before observation and maybe as much as six weeks or maybe even eight weeks uh, after the opposition date. So uh, there are some techniques that I'll be talking about, what kind of equipment you need. Uh, to do things like, uh, because it's observing planets is not the same thing as, let's say, uh, looking at uh, faint, fuzzy objects, which uh, we all of us have spent uh, a lot of time looking for. So I hope to see you all again tomorrow uh, or Friday and Saturday. And if there's any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. That was great, Pete. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, are there any questions? Because I, I, uh, I can see that there's not just one technique, uh, there's several, and uh, they do have limitations and they do have advantages. And uh, hopefully uh, as we get more telescopes and more spacecraft up there, we'll get a little bit better. I have a question. I've read where they can tell 
weather patterns on the planets. How is that possible? Can you elaborate? Well, well, if you come and uh, talk to my talk on Saturday morning at, at CSP, I'm going to talk about weather patterns on Mars, what you can see right next door to us. Uh, the weather patterns on Jupiter are a little bit different because we're only looking at clouds. But if you make that analogy for what we see in our solar system to distant planets, uh, you can see uh, variations in brightness. For example, they did that with Pluto a long time ago, and they found out one hemisphere was brighter than another. They've done that for some of the satellites and of the giant planets also. So they can get a rough idea of that thing, but I don't know how specific uh, they can get a weather forecast for 51 Pegasi B, you know, but uh, uh, I'd be interested in finding out more about that myself, Greg. <laughs> okay, I'm in Florida, so I won't be able to attend. Can you possibly record it? And well, uh, they're, they're, uh, they have limitations because it's in Goshen, Connecticut, even though that's very nearby. Uh, they do have limitation because it's a Boy Scout camp. I don't have access to any other Wi-Fi that they have available there. So I don't know what uh, what they could do, but uh, essentially, essentially, what you can what you can do, Greg, is attend the October meeting when uh, the October speaker is going to be talking about the opposition of Mars. So yeah, that's uh, me. now that huh, <laughs> that's, <me. laughs> that's you. Okay, well, <laughs> sorry you can't well, be there to hear. Him. <laughs> sorry you can't be in two places at the same time. <laughs> But that, that involves yeah. quantum entanglement, and that's above my pay grade. I love it. That's good. Yeah. Well, that'll be a two-part series, one on visual, and then the other one will be on photograph. Yeah. Um, you can look at the New Haven website. Instead of ASGH, uh, you can actually uh, contact ASNH, New Haven, Astronomical Society of New Haven, dot org and uh, look at the uh, uh uh and write to let's say the president greg barker there or the vice president or the webmaster uh there at, and ask if any of them have the ability to uh, record programs uh we do there is a speaker talking about the web tomorrow afternoon or saturday afternoon and bob berman well-known popularizer and writer for a number of magazines uh, we'll be f flying in again and uh, giving a lecture. Uh, you don't need to live stream. You can just record it on a video camera and then upload well, it to YouTube later. Well, I'll, I'll ask. I'll ask them because uh, yeah. I have uh, I have I have a big suitcase to bring, and uh, it's not his club, Greg. Yeah, well, it's not his club. Oh, I see. No, I'm I'm just a, a featured speaker for Saturday morning because I live so close that. No that uh, in case anybody can't show up, uh, they always have me, you know. So yeah, we'll just have to hear. So what I, 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 I got promoted from a Friday night uh, tent talk type, type speaker to a, uh, a headliner now. Whoa. So, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm happier than a dog with a big tail going 60 miles an hour like because there's nothing in the world fat, happier than a dog with a tail going like that you know so so uh i'm a headliner now so uh, i do programs for new haven i do programs for hartford uh, you probably you know, i did one uh on stonehenge uh, a number number of years ago that was the first one i did by zoom i didn't know anything about zoom john i'm doing well thank you i made it back home Okay, are there any, any other questions? I can't answer Greg's question on the weather, but... Uh, I, I did have one, if anybody else doesn't. So I'd let other people go first, of course. Now, I, you mentioned uh, magnetic properties uh, with, of... Um, I wasn't yeah. sure if it was a star or uh, a planet around, but it was around the, uh, the closest star, the uh, Proxima. Yeah, that one is a magnetically active star with all kinds of flaring going off. And it's probably in the catalog that uh, uh, I think Tess has put together of flaring type stars. Uh, 
Uh, and I'm, I would look forward to seeing what that looks like because that can throw a bugaboo. Uh, you'll have things like uh, uh, the Earth, which does necessarily need a magnetic field around it to preserve life on our planet. You have an even stronger magnetic field around Jupiter. And in the case of the uh, Barnard star there with or uh, Proxima Centauri with a magnetically active red dwarf star, that would essentially limit the possibilities for getting kind of life in the signs in that area. But uh, the particular paper that I mentioned uh, proposes to do this kind of observation on, on pre-selected stars that don't have magnetic activity or any kind of flaring activity, I should say. Uh, I don't know how they're going to make that determination because uh, uh, a lot of the instrumentation now uh, thinks that they can look at a, at a let's say, a, 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 a Neptune-type planet circling a, a distant star, maybe a couple hundred light years away, and finding... Uh, being able to differentiate between any kind of magnetic activity around the star from what's happening on the planet. And that, I've read the paper that's in Acta Astromica. And uh, uh, if you look at uh, that, that paper, if you, if you want, I can give you that uh, reference again. But uh, there's, there's, that's one of the two proposals I was kind of skeptical about. There's another proposal that also, I didn't even bother putting it in here. And they propose looking for Trojans around other exoplanets. Well, if you can't see the planet, how are you going to see the even smaller, dimmer, by about 14 or 15 magnitudes dimmer exoplanet, I mean, uh, Trojan satellites that might possibly be circling those stars. And I didn't even bother mentioning that i just put that out there as well something to think about in the future but it's it's wide open to uh interpretation sometimes that wasn't my question was how do stars be measured as magnetic or not what? okay well the same the same thing that happens with uh solar observations the zeman splitting of spectral lines one line connect when uh, a sunspot uh, passes around the, the, the front of the sun, you can get a coronagraph to, to actually look at it. And you can actually, there, there, is, there is one video I've seen where the, you can see that there's one, one spectral line will split into two by the Zeeman effect. And as it passes out the field of view of the coronagraph, it goes back to a single spectral line. Uh, that's one indication. Uh, the other one would be uh, uh, the, the kind of... Uh, uh, electromagnetic signature that you would get with a radio telescope, and you would in interpret it that as electrical noise more than anything. But uh, the Zeeman effect, Z E E M E M A N, uh, is a well documented laboratory indication for magnetic activity. For sunspots, were showing magnetic activity, but I didn't know how a star could be magnetic. The same, the same thing, the same thing. Okay. There, there are other stars that that do have star spots, for lack of a better word. And that's something that I was hearing about uh, uh, even uh, when uh, uh, about 30 years ago, or even beyond 30 years ago, even back 40 years ago. And uh, people were beginning to think that uh, that might be the cause of dimming of the star itself, because you have a very large sunspot, which could have quite a bit more area covered up on the star, causing a a dimming of the stars that rotated in its period of time. Uh, I think you have a lot of people at Mount Wilson were very involved with uh, uh, in the 60s and 70s looking at uh, spotted type stars. So why don't you look at uh, spotted stars on Google here and let's see if we can come up with something. I'll do the same thing. And if you're there Saturday or Friday night, I'll uh, compare notes with you. All right, stars. Will do. And yes, I will be there. Okay. Anybody else going to CSP? Besides, anybody have any other questions?
Okay. All right. Well, in case the people haven't figured it out, I've made it back home. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Pete, and I'm glad that he's speaking on another topic on Saturday, so I'll get to hear him <laughs> expand on something else. Because he's always well, very well. Together. Well, if it's cloudy Friday night, I'm I'm tempted to show uh, my Stonehenge program, which. Uh, you only saw part of when I was here last time. So uh, if it's cloudy Friday night, come on down. And uh, right. I'll, after after supper there, if you see me there after supper, then you know something's afoot. Right. Uh, yeah. You hold the record for the longest speaker at an ASGH meeting yet. Well, uh, as my, as my uh, lovely wife would say, uh, don't get them started talking about astronomy. <laughs> Just yeah. don't get them started talking about it. I think I'm second in line. Okay, Greg. Go for it. You, you, have, right. you have my permission, Greg. Go for it. <laughs> I got to try to beat Pete's record. Uh, the two of you together, ready to put a panel. <laughs> <laughs> February, we're all snowed in and we'll have a panel. Pete and Greg dueling us. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right, Peter, thank you. Okay.